Hello, welcome back to my bookshelf for another episode in the Jacobite series. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. And now, another Valentine for the villain of Whig history, the man who dared interrupt the arc of modernity. Long before being crowned James II in 1685, the Duke of York had proved his loyalty to the English nation. The fire of London in 1666, for example, brought out the best in him. James's conduct won the people's love. Multiple sources attest to his courage and dedication during those hellish days, and the brothers' tireless efforts are commemorated at Monument in the city. It was Samuel Pepys who first brought news of fire to court, having witnessed the rapid spread of the blaze. Pepys wrote, quote, I was called for, and I did tell the king and the duke what I saw, and that unless his majesty did call for houses to be pulled down, nothing could stop the fire. They seemed much troubled, unquote. Charles II eventually overrode the city authorities and put James, then Lord High Admiral, in charge of firefighting. James offered the Lord Mayor the use of the Royal Lifeguards in the elemental battle. Another noted diarist, John Evelyn, wrote that it was, quote, not indeed imaginable how extraordinary the vi vigilance and activity of the king and the duke was, even laboring in person, and being present to command, order, encourage, and reward workmen, by which he showed his affection to his people and they showed theirs, unquote. Commanding the guards, James rode the streets on horseback until the fire was finally out. Another Londoner wrote that, quote, The Duke of York hath won the hearts of the people with his continual and indefatigable pains day and night in helping to quench the fire, unquote. This then was the man who became James II. How did the patriotic, valiant, and also thoroughly competent admiral, legitimate heir to Charles II, wind up being deposed in favor of William Orange in the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688. The short answer is this. James found Catholicism and thereby lost his throne. There is a particular drama to conversion to Catholicism in the Anglosphere because it involves setting aside various cultural president prejudices. Clearly, James's embrace of Catholicism sprang from deep conviction. After all, nothing could have been less likely to win him friends among the nation's oligarchy. His conversion circa 1670 was wildly inconvenient for his brother Charles II. To understand why it was so ill-starred, we must circle back 140 years to Henry VIII. In cultivating support for his break with Rome, to dispose of his wife, Catherine of Aragon, marry Anne Boleyn, and beget a male heir, Henry began, in 1536, breaking up the monasteries, redistributing church lands and other property among agreeable nobility and gentry in return for loyalty to his project. This policy forged a new elite whose interests kept expanding exponentially. It is worth noting the fictional but highly emblematic example of Downton Abbey, which features a noble family established on the ruins of a religious house. To take a prominent historical example, Thomas Cromwell, who implemented the dissolution, took possession of a former Augustinian friary. Some of his newfound status and wealth was transmitted to his great-great-nephew, Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell emerged as the general of the New Model Army in the 1640s. After signing off on the execution of the king, Charles I, he became Lord Protector of England. Members of this milieu were hypervigilant against any form of government or policy that threatened to restore monastic lands, whether to the Catholic Church or the Anglican one. This class were profoundly invested in Protestantism, inasmuch as it allowed them to feast on the corpse of the English Catholic Church, quite apart from the claims of theologians like Martin Luther, John Calvin, or even the Lollards. 
There were, of course, some sincere reformers, mainly among the upper orders and emergent middle class. Their numbers were small, but their influence considerable. Henry VIII had little interest in either Luther or Calvin. He merely used them to secure his dynasty and enhance his personal power. Henry thought he was strengthening the monarchy by stealing fire from the Catholic Church, but he was mistaken. The new elite he created, having devoured the wealth, prestige, and power of the Church in the 16th century, turned on their master in the 17th. As G.K. Chesterton writes, quote, they had despoiled the church and were proceeding to despoil the crown, unquote. Because it was used as an excuse to plunder, first the church and then the monarchy, Protestantism is indivisible from the trajectory of modernity. James's father, Charles I, was a committed Anglican. His mother, the French princess Henrietta Maria, was a devout Catholic. Their children were raised Protestant. Although this marriage served Charles well in many respects, it rendered him vulnerable to charges of favoring Catholics. English identity had by this time become fused with Protestantism in the public mind. The old religion, practiced in the British Isles for a millennium, and under whose auspices the English first took shape as a people, had been redefined as foreign, despite the fact that 16th century Protestantism also originated abroad. Charles I's enemies strove to taint him with this fatal foreignness as well. In the run-up to the English Civil War, the elites learned to whip up anti-Catholic London mobs against the king, practice they resumed after the Restoration. During the war, they churned out pamphlets accusing Queen Henrietta Maria of assorted crimes. To justify their fear-mongering, the king's enemies could always wheel out Guy Fawkes, executed in 1605 for plotting to blow up Parliament with the king inside. James and Charles II were brought up Anglican, but both eventually converted to Catholicism. Their differing paths to the faith reflect their contrasting characters. Charles II was humorous, cynical, and practical-minded, a realist. In many respects, he was the perfect king for his time. The restored monarchy had been depleted. Gradually, the lion was shorn of its mane. The execution of Charles I had eroded the institution. Chesterton argues that monarchs were now little more than glorified politicians, adding that while Charles II was skilled at politics, James was decidedly not. What Parliament wanted, even in 1660, was a king it could control. Charles II was no puppet. In fact, he ruled as an absolute monarch for the last four years of his reign, but he grasped the nature of the era. He also understood that religion was a minefield. Despite being drawn to his mother's faith, and the fact he had promised Louis XIV to become Catholic, Charles nonetheless waited until his deathbed to call for a priest and receive the sacrament, knowing how politically unpopular his conversion would be. He had James's example to confirm it. In addition to their mother, James had a second compelling female influence. His first wife, Anne Hyde, reasoned her way to Catholicism while living in the Stuart court in exile. She converted shortly after the Restoration. Stylish and sparkling, Anne possessed a forceful charm. The king decided she would have a good effect upon his serious, conscientious, and patriotic, but somewhat stiff and formal brother. Charles may have regretted taking this view once James too became a Catholic, since it soon became clear that the Duke would not downplay his religion, no matter how much trouble ensued. Having concluded that Catholicism was true, James embraced it publicly. Parliament then passed the Test Act of 1673, which had the effect of blocking Catholics and also uh, dissenters out of conformity with Anglicanism from holding public office 
serving in the military, or graduating from university. Rather than deny his faith as the act required, James resigned his post as Lord High Admiral. The Duke remained a loyal Catholic throughout the political hurricanes of the next decades. And having died of breast cancer in 1671, James married another Catholic, Mary of Modena, two years later. He did, however, make one major concession to the king, permitting his daughters, Anne and Mary, to be raised Anglican. Their passage to royal power might therefore be smooth. James's would be anything but. Because the Duke of York was second in line to the throne, his religion became more of a political problem with every passing year. The king, despite having fathered some 16 children with multiple mistresses, never managed to produce a legitimate heir. Charles's wife, the Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza, suffered one miscarriage after another. As it became more likely that James would inherit, the Protestant elite began casting about for a preferable candidate. Some promoted Charles's illegitimate first son, James Scott, Duke of Monmouth. Another faction pinned their hopes on James's daughter Mary, who had been married off at Parliament's urging to her exceedingly Protestant cousin William, Prince of Orange. In order to justify blocking the heir apparent succession to the thrones of England, Scotland, and Ireland, James's clique of enemies now drummed up an anti Catholic panic whose divisive effects linger on today. The exclusion crisis of 1678 to 81 also forged our present political party system. Their importance can scarcely be overstated. Newspapers went on to develop in tandem with parties. Whigs campaigned against James, while Tories supported him. Most Tories were Anglican, but they favoured traditional monarchy. The Earl of Shaftesbury spearheaded efforts to legislate James out of the succession. Whigs sponsored blizzards of sensational anti-Catholic pamphlets and whipped up the public with lurid processions through London, where effigies of the Pope, monks, nuns, and priests were paraded and then burned. When it looked like the exclusion bill would pass, Charles II dissolved Parliament. This happened more than once. He basically ruled without them for the remaining years of his reign. 1683 planned to assassinate him and his brother, known as the Rye House Plot, failed. In fact, the fact that philosopher John Locke was implicated reminds us that today's right supplanted the right of yesteryear. Locke went into exile in Holland. In order to mollify the Whigs and Whigs, <laughs> and settled down the London mobs. The king ordered his brother to leave for the continent, so James went into exile again. It was not to be the last time. In 1685, Charles II died following a stroke, and James was crowned. Henry Purcell wrote the coronation anthem. Playwright Aphra Bain, close associate of the Stuarts, supplied a joyous ode these lines give a flavor, great, quote, great prince of wonders, and welcome to that throne, both your virtues and your sufferings due, by heaven and birthright all your own, you shared the danger, share the glory too, unquote. At first the king was quite popular, where Charles had been flippant and a bit lax, content to give his ministers their head, James was extremely attentive to the day-to-day -day business of governing, but he was too attentive for some tastes. James moved rapidly to improve the status of Catholics, removing barriers to advancement. He corresponded with Pope Innocent XI, who urged patience. James, James sought to form a coalition between Catholics and other dissident groups, Protestant nonconformists whose lives had also been blighted by the Test Act. He strove hard to gain their support, putting some, such as the Presbyterian Earl of Sandwich, into key positions. 
He also released Catholics and other dissidents in prison for practicing their faith. James had made a rare, if rather unlikely, friend in William Penn, the influential Quaker who later founded Pennsylvania. It has recently come to light that James and William Penn toured the country together in 1687, speaking to groups of subjects on a shared vision of religious liberty. It was un-English, argued James, to force men in matters of conscience. He required his Declaration of Indulgence to be read in all churches, calling it his new Magna Carta. William Penn remained loyal to James in the turbulent years that followed. Meanwhile, Whig propagandists had summoned the Phantom. England's second-to-last Catholic monarch, Mary Tudor, haunted their dreams and their discourse. They actually invented the nickname Bloody Mary, roughly 120 years after her death. Soon, they implied James would drop the mask of tolerance and start burning Protestants. He was a tyrant in the making, they insisted. James was, and still is, classified alongside Mary I and Charles I as uniquely stubborn by mainstream historians because they inconveniently resist the Enlightenment historical model. Loyalty to tradition is neatly reclassified as a character flaw, obstinacy. It is, of course, no coincidence that the three monarchs who came into conflict with the group forged and incentivized by Henry VIII received notably harsh treatment by Whig historians. In Patchwork, Mencius Moldbug imagines future schoolchildren learning that our present period began with the Dutch invasion of England, 1688. Standard history textbooks give it a different name, Glorious Revolution. The term, which sounds like it was penned by Chairman Mao, may be understood as an ink cloud shot out in an effort to obscure the reality of a coup. What happened next underscores the flimsy state of monarchy post Charles I's execution, for when the Whig lords deemed the king inconvenient, they simply deposed him. James's enemies panicked when his second wife, Mary of Modena, gave birth to a boy on June 10, 1688. James Francis Edward Stuart would supersede James's Protestant daughters. Fearing a Catholic succession, the Whig lords now manufactured a rumor that the baby was a changeling. The bizarre claim was that the imposter child had been smuggled into a, the palace in a warming pan. Three weeks later, they moved to force the king from his throne, inviting William of Orange, the husband of James's daughter Mary, to invade England. 15,000 Dutch troops marched on London. Mary rode among them. John Locke, the Whig's intellectual hero, returned along with this group. The prospect of going to war with his daughter was deeply distressing for James, who was an extraordinarily affectionate father. He had weathered a number of defections, but when he learned that his second daughter Anne had joined enemy ranks, he despaired, exclaiming, quote, God help me, even my children have forsaken me, unquote. James then ordered a retreat, much to the frustration of those who remained loyal to him. In a way, it is unsurprising that James balked here. Consider what happened to his father, Charles I. Having fought the Civil War and then fallen into enemy hands, fathers of those who oppose James now, Charles was put on trial and executed. James had escaped from the very people who put his father to death. He had grown up fighting this group. Likely he expected to share his father's fate. James retreated and once again went into exile under the protection of his cousin Louis XIV. James took kingship too seriously for Whiggish tastes. Because he did not fit the Whigs' revised ideal of monarchy, they deposed him in favor of a pair of rulers who did. In the words of G.K. Chesterton's close associate, Hilaire Belloc, quote, he was destroyed 
by a small clique of great fortunes, unquote. William and Mary came to the throne having agreed to a much restricted role. From a reactionary perspective, we cannot fault James for his loyalty to tradition. We can, however, reproach him for failing to govern successfully. Still, his efforts deserve to be remembered. He worked to improve the lot of Catholics and other dissenters. His vision of religious liberty under what Belloc terms popular monarchy must have restored, might have restored unity to a nation shattered by the Protestant Reformation. The coup against him had the result of deepening ethnic conflict both within England and among the nations of the British Isles. Had James remained on the throne, for example, the political landscape of Ireland would have been much different, as, as we shall see in the next video. He once said this, quote, If occasion were, I hope God would give me his grace to suffer death for the true Catholic religion, as well as banishment. James never had to die for the faith, but his self-sacrifice is undeniable. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next installment.